Hello, this is Ray Farrow. Glad to be with you as we get ready to teach Isaiah chapter 6, 1 through 13. I'm always so thankful to the staff of Kyoki for giving me this opportunity to teach. I, I know I say it every time, but I really am um, grateful and honored for that, uh, that privilege. And thanks to Mary Dan for filming and editing, uh, doing all the behind the scenes work uh, along with the other tech folks to get this out to you. Uh, that is a ministry that uh, ought to be recognized because it's, it's because of their ministry uh, that you get to see this. And I hope you will not only uh, glean from this, but if you know folks who could use um, this teaching and this message, let them know about it too. So we got background last week, historical context, background of Isaiah, and we talked about the key themes that would, we, we would study throughout this book. So if you didn't get that, go back to last week's lesson. We'll not take time here. We'll just jump right in. Isaiah 6, 1 through 13 is Isaiah's calling. We noted last week that Isaiah is different from other prophetic books in that the call of Isaiah doesn't come right at the beginning of the book. God launches into his case against his people in the southern kingdom of Judah for breaking their covenant with him. Uh, instead, the calling of Isaiah comes here in chapter 6, and then we're not told exactly why the structure is the way it is. We do get some, some clues or hints. If you go to Isaiah 5 and you look, that whole chapter is uh, talking about Israel and God's people and, and Judah as well being God's vineyard. That is uh, a love song poured out from the uh, keeper, the owner, the landowner of the vineyard who sets out a good vineyard with good grapes and, and he prepares it and he expects that the vineyard that he cares so well for and so lovingly for and protected and kept all the, the predators who would damage the vines or steal the fruit. He's kept all those predators out of the vineyard and yet the vineyard hasn't produced the good sweet grapes that he expects. And so the owner of the vineyard says, you know, what, what am I going to do? And he says, I'm going to remove my protection from the vineyard. I'm going to stop uh, all this love and care because what is due to me, what I should be able to expect, isn't forthcoming. And that's the picture of God to his people. He says, I've loved you, I've protected you, I've set you in this good land. You're my, my choice vineyard. He often calls his people his choice vineyard throughout the Old Testament. And yet they don't respond in kind with love and thankfulness and obedience and holiness and proper service. And so God says, I'm going to remove my protection. And as you go down through chapter 5, he, he gives them the reasons why he's doing this. Uh, uh, and of course, the one time that we don't uh, silence our phones and catches us every time. There's a lesson. Be, be, be prepared. So God goes down and, and he lists why uh, they've done him wrong, how they've done him wrong. And he says, I'm going to call to foreign nations and I'm going to, to whistle for them from the ends of the earth. And they're going to come speedily, quickly, and they're going to devour you. He's speaking of the upcoming exile of the southern kingdom. And we remember as Isaiah is giving these words during his reign, it won't even be another 20 years from the time he's telling them what he's telling them in Isaiah 5 and 6. It won't even be another 20 years before the northern kingdom of Israel is taken away. The people he's preaching to in the southern kingdom, it will still be a while yet. It'll be over, uh, be, uh, over a century, about a century and a half before they're taken away. Uh, but he's warning them and he says, this is God's warning to you. He says, I'm going to, to send these other nations and uh, Isaiah is careful to tell the people, look, when these other nations 
come upon the northern kingdom and come upon you and take you away, don't think like the heathen nations around you think. Well, if a people is defeated in battle, if they get exiled, that must mean that their god or goddess or pantheon of gods weren't strong enough against the other nation's gods to defeat those gods. Their gods must be somehow lacking. No, God, the one true God, the only God, the three in one is saying, I am the God over all the earth. We're going to see that in Isaiah 6. And so everyone does my bidding according to my ultimate purpose. So I will use other nations to punish and deal with you. But when I do that, don't think that I'm a weak God who couldn't protect you. I'm removing my protection to let you know how serious I am about your sin and the fact that you deserve to be punished. And so and that's the background as we come to Isaiah 6. The loving owner of the vineyard has said, I'm removing my protection because you refuse to follow and to listen to me. So now we come to Isaiah 6 and it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, Isaiah says. So in the year that King Uzziah died, Uzziah had been reigning since he was 16. He'd reigned 52 years and now he's died. And so the picture is um, there's decay, there's some, uh, and, and Uzziah was a great king. He was a, uh, a planner, he was a, an architect, he was a great builder, a builder of war machines, something of an engineer. He was a good, he was a great general. He defeated the Philistines and other nations uh, with his armies. He was a, a great and wise king. It says in 2 Kings 15, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. In 2 Chronicles 26, 5, he said he sought God in the days of Zechariah. And as it says, as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. But then the scripture goes on to say in 2 Chronicles 26, 8, that though Uzziah was a great king to the point that, quote, his fame spread as far as the entrance of Egypt, Though he was a great king and though others knew about him, uh, he met a tragic ending because it says in 2 Chronicles 26, 16, but when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of the Lord. And as a response, God struck Isaiah with leprosy, and he died apart from uh, his palace, apart from others. He died alone as a leper. And that's how, that's how he was remembered in his last days. And so uh, uh, the biblical scholar David Guzik says, um, so to say, when Isaiah begins, so to say, in the year King Uzziah died, as our scripture begins, is to say a lot. It is to say, in the year a great and wise king died, but it's also to say, in the year a great and wise king who had a tragic end died. So Guzik said, Isaiah had great reason to be discouraged and disillusioned at the death of King Uzziah because a great king had passed away and because his life ended tragically. Guzik asked, where is the Lord in all of this? And probably Isaiah was thinking, where is the Lord in all this? Our great king has died and, and he died a leper? judged by God. What, what's God doing? And so that's why this picture that what Isaiah is going to see next is so important. And the first, uh, first of our section of, of topics today is uh, first, if we want to outline, we say this is Isaiah seeing. 
When Isaiah could be disappointed, discouraged, and disillusioned, he needs to see things as they really are. And the scripture says, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw, what did Isaiah see? I saw the Lord. He sees him in a vision, like uh, Ezekiel and Daniel and Paul all had heavenly visions. I saw the Lord where seated, sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple, which can also mean palace. That word can also mean palace. So Isaiah, when the world around him seems to be in decay and the leader that uh, he and others have counted on for decades is now passed away when there, there seems to be maybe a time of trouble and tumult coming as Isaiah has warned the people and said, this is what God's going to do if you don't repent. In that time, Isaiah gets a vision where he sees the Lord sitting on a throne. Now, what, what is a throne? Uh, a throne isn't just a, a, a chair. Anybody can sit on a chair. A so throne isn't just a stool or a seat. A throne is a, is a chair or a seat where a king sits or where a judge sits. Somebody with sovereignty and authority. Anybody can sit in a chair, as one has said, but a throne is reserved for a king. And so he sees the, the, the one great God, the three in one, sitting on a throne. It's as if God wants to say, Isaiah, I know you're shaken. Your king, earthly king, has died. But Isaiah, even though King Uzziah is no longer on the throne. I am still on the throne. I, your God, am still on the throne. And the picture is God and his, his train filling the temple. And the idea there in the ancient times, the kings would wear uh, great long robes with long trains, kind of like you know, when a woman wears a wedding dress that has a, a long train uh, on her bridal day or wedding day, is she ready to go out and work? Is she ready to go out and walk and travel and stoop and bend? No, she has to have a bridesmaids kind of carrying her train as she, as she goes in and out. The, and that's the picture in ancient days. A king would have these long trains that would make it difficult or impossible to do any work. Because the idea is, I'm the king, I'm sovereign, I don't have to stoop to do the work. Others work for me. I am so high and lifted up that others do my bidding. And so, so that's the picture as this train fills the whole temple. Now, we don't know whether this was uh, Solomon's temple. We don't know whether this was a, a palace. Um, it seems unlikely that it would have been the, the, the regular temple where Isaiah sees this vision because if so, he would have been right in the Holy of Holies where God resided and, and that was such a sacred place. It could just be that this is a vision of uh, God's heavenly palace. Uh, but however, however this, uh, wherever this uh, temple, this palace is, is taking place, it's clear that Isaiah is seeing the true God high and lifted up. That's a, that's a phrase that means as high as you can be exalted. It says around him uh, the angels... Uh, oh, and I, I want to make a point before we go there. Um, we talked about King Uzziah and his life, and it says um, that when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, which is a great point that uh, Isaiah is going to have to think about and worry about because destruction has not come yet to the southern kingdom. Things are going well and they are still prosperous. Uzziah has just died and uh, the, the goodness and the reforms and the upbuilding and the additional land and the economic prosperity of King Uzziah's reign they're still all in place. Isaiah's trying to warn them that 
it's not going to. It may not be long before they begin to see if they don't return to God. They, they begin to see the problem uh, about them, and, and he wants them to see that. But right now, things are going really well. And so I want to ask you, and I, and I ask myself, in what ways do we forget God when we're doing well and when our heart is lifted up because we're strong? When you're thinking, I can make things happen, do you forget to pray? and seek God's wisdom because I got this? Do you forget to, to ask God for advice and lay your day before His and say, Lord, this isn't my day, this is your day. How can I serve you and glorify you? When, when things are going well, do you forget to ask for your daily bread? Do you forget to say, I, I know that you know all that I have comes from God or do you feel in charge and, and in control? Because that's what happened to King Uzziah. So ask yourself right now, if things are going well in your life, say, am I praising God during the days of sunshine or do I only come back to Him crying during the days of rain and storm? So, Isaiah sees God high and lifted up and he sees His robes and the cherubim, or excuse me, the seraphim are around him. Above God stood the seraphim. Now that's not to say that the seraphim, who are a, a, a branch of the angels, the name literally means burning ones, that's not to say that the seraphim are above God in rank or stature, merely that they are around him in service to him. And each had six wings, and with two, the seraph Seraphim is plural, the seraph is singular. The seraph would cover his face because it, it said in, in Exodus and other places, Deuteronomy, that no man, God told Moses, no man can look on my face, can see my face and live. So with two, they would cover their face. With two wings, they would cover their feet. The ideas of humility that, that God should not see such a, a lowly pedestrian part as the feet, and with two he flew, suggesting that the, those two wings would enable him to go for God and to serve God, and, and that really is the right proportion, isn't it? Think about it. Four of the wings, two-thirds have to do with adoration and worship and humility in the presence of God, showing God how great he is and how we stand before him in, in, in adoration and don't try to puff ourselves up too much. And then the other third of, of the Sarah's body was used for service. Often, I'm just I'm speaking men to men now here, guys to guys, and, but this may apply to, to women as well. Is your gift, do you tend to want to serve the Lord and go and do, ah, forget all that theology stuff, forget all that Bible study stuff, that touchy-feely worship adoration, blah, 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 singing. Forget all this. Man, I just want to go out and, and serve. I just want to do a project for the Lord. I'm a hands-on kind of Christian. Well, folks, take a lesson from the angels who serve God. Two-thirds of the wings devoted to adoration, humility, and worship, one-third to service. Service certainly is important, but, but that reflects our head, heart, hands tradition here at Kaioki. Why head and heart first? Why our thinking and, and using our brains for God and our passions and emotions and adoring God? Why two devoted just to God because you're not going to serve well, you're not going to work well for God if you don't know who He is, if you don't understand who He is, and if you're not passionate about serving Him, if you don't engage head and heart, you're going to become like the southern kingdom we read about last week in chapter 1. Yeah, you're working for Him, you're doing the ritual, but your heart and your head, your understanding, are not in it. So the seraphim give us a great lesson 
And we have to ask ourselves, do we look just at, at our worship of God as being a worship of service, or are we also spending time with God, worshiping, studying, and, and just praising Him for who He is? And how do they praise Him? for who he is. It says in verse 3, And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And that second part of the verse means not just the whole earth has pockets or patches or niches or spaces where his glory may be seen. Another way to translate that is the fullness of the earth. All of the earth, the fullness of the earth is his glory. Meaning there isn't a space pocket or patch that doesn't somehow declare that God has made it and who he is and how great he is. All of the earth points to God's glory. And notice that these burning ones, you'll read sometimes about the the seraphim and, and the cherubim. The cherubim are described in Ezekiel's chapters 1 and 10 as burning and light torches and, and like flames. So whatever the, if there are differences between cherubim and seraphim, certainly the similarities are great uh, and greater that they serve God, worship Him, and that they are burning or flaming uh, uh, type creatures. They are calling to one another and they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Notice the angels called to each other. They're not calling, holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. They're calling to one another. Folks, God can hear his praise when we praise him to others. Let me ask you, when word gets back to you, that someone else has said something nice about you outside your presence, doesn't that compliment make you feel good? Yes, we should still praise God and say, God, I praise you, I adore you. But let me ask you, do you praise him in the presence of others? And they cry, holy, holy, holy. That's the only descriptor of God that's mentioned three times in the Bible. It's his holiness. That idea of holiness is set apartness. God makes us holy because we're set apart for his service to reflect his glory or likeness. God's holiness is not just a, a trait of God, something he might turn on and off. Every aspect, every attribute of God is imbued with His holiness. God's love is a holy love. His power to act is a holy power. His wisdom, holy wisdom. His mercy is a holy mercy in that He's merciful to us by saving us, but He doesn't just act as though sin has never occurred. His holiness has required the death of His Son. So His holiness is seen in everything that He does. And why do they cry out, holy, 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 three times? Why not just once? Why not just, if they want to emphasize it, why not twice? Well, first of all, that third time is to exalt it to the highest degree. To say God is the holiest of anything that can be holy. God isn't just holier than us. He's not just stronger or a greater lover, right? He's not just older than man. God is completely set apart and different. And even the angels who have never sinned or fallen, they still in humility cover themselves because they recognize God is deity. He's the creator and they're just creatures. And so uh, uh, the idea is God is raised up to the highest of the high because he's completely different from anything else that, that has, is created. He is the, the one to the highest degree who exudes holiness. And, and secondly, I think they say, that, say it three times because they're magnifying and glorifying the three persons in the Trinity. The Father is holy, yes. But the Son is holy too, and the Spirit, why we call the Spirit the Holy Spirit. 
And so when they say this, the, the seraphim have, have such power in themselves. Not They're not powerful like God is, but they have so, their voices have such power. When they say this, the, the foundations, the doorposts where Isaiah is looking in on the scene, they begin to tremble and they begin to shake. And, and smoke fills this temple or this palace. And, and that's so indicative of and illustrative of God's presence. We remember God followed the Israelites as a pillar of cloud. When he was on Sinai, smoke was on top of the mountain. And we, we see other times where uh, God will descend uh, and, and there will be a cloud or smoke. So this is in keeping with that image of God. Smoke uh, fills the whole house. And when Isaiah sees the glory of God, and he sees how the angels themselves who have voices that can make the whole palace shake, when he sees how they worship and treat God with such respect, and he thinks of himself and, and how he exists before God and the people around him exist in the lives they've been living, Isaiah is undone. He says, and I said, as a response to what he's seen, woe is me for I'm lost. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Why? Why does he know that now? How is he seeing rightly now? He says, for I have seen the Lord. We can all think we're pretty hot stuff until we get a real vision and see who God is. And then that shrinks us down. So having seen, Isaiah realizes he should be sorry. And the people around him, they keep going through ritual worship, but they're not really seeing God as they should. Isaiah immediately is sorry. He says, woe is me. This is the phrase, uh, Hebrew phrase, Oi, oi is mir, woe is me. When, when you sometimes hear a Jewish person lament, uh, oi, it's, it's a feeling of woe, like uh-oh, something isn't right. He says, for I am lost. I, I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people un, of unclean lips. So he's, the, the idea there of being lost or, or undone, it, it's almost it's like disintegrating. If you saw... Avengers Endgame and something horribly cosmically wrong took place. It was in, in Infinity Wars and Avengers Endgame. You saw when, when something went cosmically horribly wrong and death came that the characters in those movies just seemed to like disintegrate, turn to almost ash, and then blow away. That's the idea. He's got, he's, Isaiah's saying, you know, when I see the cosmic significance of the holiness of God and recognize my sin before that holiness, it's like, man, I'm coming apart. I am undone. And notice that Isaiah, as a, as a good leader and as a true prophet, he doesn't just blame those around him, though he does have words of challenge or rebuke to them from the Lord. You know, he's not the big brother saying, hey, you messed up. Dad's really going to give it to you now. No, he, he brings this upon himself first and says, I am a man of unclean lips before he ever talks about the people around him. And so, having seen the truth, Isaiah is sorry. Unfortunately, it's only Isaiah at this moment who recognizes his sin and his coming deserved punishment and his peril. And, but God acts when true repentance comes. God, in his mercy, acts and takes initiative because, remember, it says, it, uh, it doesn't say... It doesn't say that God says to the seraphim, to the seraph, go and take this coal. But remember, the, seraph, the seraphim do God's bidding. They don't do things of their own accord and initiative. So clearly, God has made it clear that if repentance comes, that this is the next step. 
Then one of the seraphim flew to Isaiah, having in his hand a burning coal that he'd taken with tongs from the altar. And if this was a vision of, the, of Solomon's temple, there was an altar for burnt offerings and an altar of incense where, you know, praise and prayer were offered to God. Sometimes prayer asking forgiveness for, um, uh, for sin. Um, but either way, whether this is a, a separate kingly palace that Isaiah is seeing, either way, the idea is sin and atonement for sin is being taken care of in this moment. And when this seraphim comes, again, this is not the seraph, or this uh, seraphim is plural, this is not the seraph on his own initiative. God is taking the initiative to help Isaiah. Isaiah doesn't even cry out and say, Lord, what shall I do? What's to become of me? He, in his humility, says, "It basically, it's over. But God is the one who says, it's over. It's not that it isn't over until the fat lady sings. As long as the angels are singing, holy, 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 and, and you know, we now, we draw breath. It isn't over till God says it's over. And the, temp, the, the coal is, bought, is brought from the altar and it touches Isaiah's lips. And that immediately made me think of that, that cleansing, healing picture in Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade. Maybe you remember it. It was the one where Sean Connery is Indiana Jones's father. Harrison Ford's father, and he, and he gets shot. So he's a victim of, of man's wickedness. They're searching for the Holy Grail, and, and as he's dying, Harrison Ford brings the, the cup that Christ drank from. Now, this isn't biblical. I don't know about the theology, but he brings the cup uh, that Christ drank from, and he's got water in it, and Sean Connery is given water from the, the Grail of Christ, and it's poured onto this bullet wound, and it, it cauterizes, and he suffers, and then it's made new, and the, and the wound just disappears, and it's the picture, it's a picture of both the, 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 the suffering that, that takes place, but the complete cleansing and healing that comes from the cup of Christ, or in this picture, it comes from the, the altar uh, where God resides and where God atones for sin. So I, I love that picture. Even in modern times, Steven Spielberg still recognized that picture of God's atoning, healing um, um, grace and power. So the, the coal touches Isaiah's mouth, and um, immediately he's, God declares him ready and fit for service. So after Isaiah says, I'm sorry, God says the first step, now that you say you're sorry, is you need to be saved. You need to be taken out of the pit of destruction and placed on a lower pedestal where you have the pedigree as one who can go out and speak and serve as one sent. So you not only have to be saved, you have to be made holy or set apart. God doesn't just say, okay, I'm going to forgive your sins. Now live however you want and for whoever you want. He says, you're saved to be set apart by me, to be made holy like me, and you're going to be saved to be sent to speak and serve. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, now that Isaiah is saved, he says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go forth? Notice, God hasn't said, hasn't had to say, Go take that coal to Isaiah. Hasn't said anything. Right? Notice, God hasn't said, I'm holy. The angels around him declare that. God hasn't said, Okay, Isaiah. Now I've saved you, and you're ready. That's all clearly understood by the holiness and the gift, the gesture of God saving Isaiah. 
Now God says, whom shall I send? Notice, he doesn't force Isaiah. He doesn't say, Isaiah, you've been brought here to go on a mission. That's why you're given this vision. He says, whom shall I send? Well, whom shall I? Who's going to go serve for me? And Isaiah, who now sees clearly God is still on the throne. Clearly God is holy and in control and powerful. God, here I am. I'll volunteer. The beginning of your lesson said, you know, the armed services have a, they all have a formula that basically says never volunteer for anything. But Isaiah, having seen who God is and who God has now made him, says, count on me, Lord. I volunteer. I will go. And here am I. Send me. He doesn't just say, yeah, here I am and I'll adore you. Here I am and now I can worship you rightly again. Once he sees who God is, who God is, he says, send me. Don't just let me sit back on my blessed assurances. Don't just let me worship in church. Send me to do your work. And he said, God said, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but don't understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, their ears heavy, blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, when I heard that message, wow, I'm going to keep preaching this stuff to them, and they're not going to turn and repent and see and be sorry? Well, wow. how long, O Lord, verse 11, he said, until cities lie waste, without inhabitant, and houses without people, and the land's a desolate waste, and the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And, and he'll go on to, to, to finish. He says, and he says, I'm not going to destroy everybody, verse 13, and though a tenth remain in it, in other words, he says, I'll kill an exile till only a tenth remain. And even when only a tenth remain, they're still going to suffer. That tenth will be burned again uh, like a, a terebinth or an oak. In other words, uh, like a tree that's been 90% cut down to the stump, but the stump gets burned. Or the stump, you know, something that happens to the stump, God says, even what's left is going to be burned. And Isaiah says the holy seed is its, is its stump. So here's the picture. Isaiah is going to be sent, and we would say, wait a minute, and he, he proclaims this message, and you say, wait a minute, doesn't the Lord want people to repent? Doesn't he want them to turn around and, and, and serve him again? And uh, uh, the picture, as your author tells you, the picture here is, is just like when Jesus preached to the people in Matthew 13, verses 14 and 15. Um, he says, you know, when Jesus preached parables, he, he says, I preach in parables to see if they care enough to really learn the meaning and go deeper, or whether they're just shallow surface followers and not real worshipers and disciples. The picture here, God, don't you want the people to repent? Why do they keep not listening? Why don't you do something? The author of your lesson says, first, God, he's foreseen the attitude and the response of the people. He knew they weren't going to hear and repent. He's just telling Isaiah, this is what you can expect as you go about your ministry and work. Secondly, the word of the Lord here reveals the condition of the hearers. All right? Sometimes uh, when you bring light into a room, it may cause somebody reading a book to say, oh, that's much better, and a cockroach to scurry. Light brings different reactions, and the word of the Lord is going to bring different reactions to people. Thirdly, the people had already made their choice. Just like when Pharaoh refused and refused to acknowledge the true God back in Egypt, the people of Judah and Israel, they were going to keep choosing to rebel against God. And lastly, there comes a point when sin must be paid for. God's going to save a remnant, but, you know, as, as, as the thing said in the Fantastic Four, it's clobbering time. God has had enough, and sin has got to be paid for, because true repentance has not come 
for this people. And, and Jesus quoted Isaiah extensively in saying to the people of his day, it's just like back then. You keep thinking you see the way things are, but you don't really see and understand and repent because you don't want to deep down in your hearts. And God, God keeps trying to change you and you keep rejecting him. But God still kept a remnant. He says, the holy seed is his stump. The picture is, there are still going to be those who through this suffering and exile are going to be loyal to me. And though they aren't as many, you know, uh, only a tenth, yet they will continue in obedience, having been chastened. And from this stump of a people, from this small southern kingdom of Judah and Benjamin, I'm going to bring a holy seed. One, remember, the seed of Mary, the seed of a woman, excuse me, eventually would come to save us. That was the promise in Genesis in the Garden of Eden, that the seed of a woman, the Holy One, would come and bring salvation. And where did that Holy One, that Holy Seed come from? From a, from a decimated, disillusioned, people almost destroyed. Where did that Holy Seed come from? It came from the tribe of Judah and with Jesus Christ. So let me ask you, now that you know God's holiness and, and see who you are and recognize how he has saved you, like Isaiah, will you be sent? Are you willing to go out and, and serve the Lord? Not just stay where you are. Will you be sent? Well, guess what? God is sending you. You may not have a missionary call to India or Africa. You have a missionary call to your family and your friends in Appling and Evans. You have a missionary call to the people you work with. Are you going to allow God to send you out today and tomorrow? And will you go and share? Isaiah wasn't just to go out and do good deeds before his people and be holy. He was to speak, God says, and say to this people. You can't just, you know, hey, I'm a good person. Let me show you how to be a good person. Be that kind of witness. You have to say to them, this is how you can be saved. And you have to, you have to acknowledge your sin and other people's sin. So will you be sent to speak as well as to serve with your hands and feet. And when things look bad, when even the last tenth suffers again, are they still going to trust in God? It's, it's interesting, the, the, Isaiah talks about even the tenth of the terebinth or oak. Why does he say the tenth of that specific tree? It says because those were the trees that were used to make the wooden idols that the people worshiped. So God says, I'm gonna, you trust in that idol made from that tree? I'm gonna completely chop down that tree and burn its stump and say, now, these idols you serve, these things you put in your life before me, and this goes right to modern times, what are they doing for you? How are they helping? I will destroy them and then say to you, now, are you ready to come back? and speak and serve and recognize my holiness. That's the vision for you today. God is calling you and he's calling me. A holy, glorious, dramatic vision greater than perhaps any calling vision or any vision at all in the Bible except for those in Revelations. That's how dramatic that was and how dramatic God's call on your life is. Will you serve him today? Amen, brothers and sisters.